Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm sorry to be uh, joining uh, late um, <clears throat> and therefore not be uh, able to um, um, hear uh, all the presentations. It's very early in New York. Uh, my apologies uh, for that. Um, just a, a few uh, uh, comments on from my side, <clears throat> and I hope to be uh, to engage more directly in the in the discussion. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we um, um, are clearly facing a, a, a very uh, difficult uh, time in, in, in history um, where so many different uh, risks are, are emerging um, and are interacting with each other. Um, this is something that, that I think really started in, in, in 1989 um, with the fall of the Berlin Wall where we had a fairly stable uh, bilateral, bipolar world. Um, that, that first moved in the 1990s to a more unipolar world um, that was for some time relatively stable, but, but certainly at the UN had a, a period of, of uh, euphoria even um, in, in terms of uh, what uh, we thought that the international system could, could produce and um, uh, in terms of uh, collaboration, um, but also in terms of, of peace dividends in, in, by reducing military expenditures. Um, and that um, um, world order uh, very quickly um, became a much more fragile and, and interconnected and uh, vulnerable world um, that already showed its, its uh, ugly side in, in the late 90s through various uh, um, uh, financial crises um, that uh, um, both in, in Latin America and in, and in Asia um, uh, revealed itself, um, and that um, I think process continued uh, certainly in, in the 2000 um, with 9/11 uh, uh, and, and various other risks uh, arising around uh, terrorism, violent extremism, uh, organized crime, and interconnectedness between these uh, different issues as, as well, and therefore <clears throat> we uh, uh, we live at the moment in a much more uh, a fragile world that is is multipolar um, um, and maybe even chaotic, as the Secretary General has has said, um, and, and a complete uh, reassessment, of course, of, of some of the instruments that we have is necessary, also because of the um, uh, war in in Ukraine. Um, what we what we saw already over the last ten years or so that. Um, uh, the the number of, of violent conflicts were increasing. They were becoming more protracted, more complex, uh, driven by uh, multiple factors that that were often difficult to to identify. Were, were changing over time, uh, partly because of of connections between uh, a terrorist group and transnational uh, organized crime groups, <clears throat> and therefore. Um, uh, become much more difficult to, to address uh, through the traditional tools of, of the United Nations, including peacekeeping operations and um, special uh, political missions. And uh, on the one hand, and, and uh, facilitation, mediation, and using the good office of the Secretary General on the other hand, uh, partly because of two important characteristics. Uh, first, um, the number of uh, non-state armed actors uh, increased a, a lot. Um, a, in, in Syria alone, there are more than a, a thousand non-state armed groups, um, and um, uh, that is uh, significantly more difficult to, to reach a, a, a peace agreement, um, as was so successful during the Cold War, when we basically could put together two different groups, um, a negotiate a peace agreement, put peacekeepers on the ground to support the implementation of the peace agreement, um, and that and that went very well um, in in Southern Africa and Central America, etc. Um, the other uh, important factor is the, the really fast increase um, in external uh, engagement in um, civil wars, um, and and that uh, was, for example, uh, clearly documented in the UCPD data, but 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 analyzed also in the UN World Bank Pathways for, Pathways for Peace report. Um, and that makes um, these traditional instruments of the UN so much more difficult.
<clears throat> so the, one of the, the consequences, I think, of all of this is that, that peace building has become um, so much more uh, important um, and the focus on prevention as uh, clearly within the UN, we, we, we're spending, um, or the international community in general, um, too much resources on um, crisis uh, management and crisis response that, that are clearly unsustainable um, and therefore a focus on prevention and, and peace building um, through uh, a more comprehensive and coherent um, approaches um, that is really should be a responsibility of the entire UN system um, is, is so um, critically uh, important. Um, so maybe I'll leave it here for, for some introductory remarks and then I'm happy to engage further in uh, during the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Hank Yen. Um, <clears throat> thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I'm sure all of you will agree that we've had quite a, a riveting um, display of knowledge. Uh, we've done a tour de table from Syria to uh, Colombia to Mozambique uh, and um, to South Africa. Uh, I would like to open it up for questions from the audience. So we have three. We'll start with the, um, the lady on the right, um, and then the gentleman there, and um, in the middle, the two, and then yourself. Okay, hi, thank you so much. So actually my, my question uh, is for, for the paper uh, in Turkey. Um, so I was thinking about, so the results that you have and the difference between Kurds and Turks kind of got me thinking. I don't know the context very well. Uh, but I was thinking, so do you know if, um, if most of um, the people coming from Syria, if they are Sunnis or Shiites? So what I'm thinking here is that at this, relatively at the same time, Kurds were fighting ISIL, so they were fighting as Sunnis, although it, they are not from the same uh, group. So I was thinking if maybe this is what's kind of uh, going on here in terms of perceptions. So that was like my, my big question. Uh, and then I also have a question for the Columbia paper, uh, for Rob. Um, so I know that the paper is already published, as you said, but I was just thinking if you have because part of your treatment was to come up with this um, roadmap for solutions. So I was thinking, this is, um, this is going to differ from village to village, right? So do you have some variation there? And can you look at that? Maybe, I don't know if you look at that in the paper, maybe it's a spill of uh, paper, I don't know. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to collect them. So there was the uh, gentleman at the back, and there were three gentlemen in the middle, if I understand. So let's let's collect uh, three, and then um, we'll we'll come to the answers. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot. I have a question to Rob Blair and the Columbia study. That's fantastic work. Thanks a lot. Um, Following up on the previous question. Oh, sorry, please introduce yourself as well. Oh, sorry about no that. Problem. My name is Krzysztof Krakowski. I'm uh, from Collegio Carlo Alberto in Turin. So following up on that question, <clears throat> I would imagine that some of the violence in the post-conflict setting can be related to some illicit activities that emerged during the war and continue to be present in these localities, such as drug trafficking. Wouldn't can uh, uh, juntas uh, de acción comunal in combination with legal authorities somehow address these issues? Because I would expect that there might be in these places some sort of backfire effect because you, know, you can't go to the police with something which is illegal. And the second one, very brief, are juntas de acción comunal in a way some some ways discriminatory, I don't know, against poorer people, against people from some ethno-racial ethno groups such as indigenous or Afro-Colombian communities, and how this combination with legal authorities can address that problem. Thanks. And then can we come to the middle, and there are a couple of questions, and the gentleman behind as well. Thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Ton Dirks. I work at Swiss Peace and the University of Basel, Switzerland. Um, I actually also had a question on the Columbia paper, um, but, I, but maybe one that is, well, connects to the other questions. Um, in your presentation, you, you mentioned uh, the work by Anna Arjona. 
Um, I think one of the key t takeaways from that book is that uh, rebel governance differs uh, geographically between different territories by the same group. Um, and also the strength of pre-existing institutions have an influence on that. Um, I was wondering whether you saw that in your own research, uh, whether, uh, let's say, um, uh, strong forms or sophisticated forms of rebel governance have uh, an effect and, and does that uh, leave different legacies uh, in, well, the cases that, that you looked at? Um, thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Olani de Muftar from uh, Con West Africa. Uh, my question or comment goes to the second presenter of the, of the paper. Uh, in your conclusion, the paper concludes that uh, the community rely less on armed group and that uh, you recommend for uh, exploiting complementarity between the state and the common authorities. Uh, based on my experience in Nigeria, particularly in the Northwest, we notice that the community rely more on armed group than the state and communal authority. And uh, we also realize that uh, the communal authorities and the state are even perpetrators of conflict in the area. So therefore, people believe to go for the support of the armed group, neglecting the state and the communal authority. So here, my dilemma is this. That don't you think the issue of trust and the need for peace badly matter in establishing whether complementarity between the state and common authority will work for peace or not? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, should we have a stab at answering the questions and then we'll move on uh, to, to the second round of questions, if that's okay? Thank you for the question. Ladies first. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, th actually, this is a really good question. Um, unfortunately, the Turkish government is not sharing us the information about the ethnic you know, uh, diversity in the Syrian refugee population, but we have some information from the survey studies. And um, it shows that the majority of the Syrian refugees in Turkey are Sunnis, actually, Sunni Arabs. But this is not that much relevant for, the, for our analysis because the uh, majority of Kurdish people are also Sunni uh, Muslims. So I think here the issue is whether they were Syrian Kurds or Syrian Arabs. And um, in the period that we analyze here so far, it looks uh, until 2015. And actually, the Syrian Kurds migrated uh, refuge uh, to Turkey uh, right after the uh, siege of Kobani, if uh, you followed from the news. So there were m almost 400,000 uh, uh, Syrian Kurds who had to migrate to Turkey because of the siege. Um, so our analysis, therefore, just not capturing that part very well, but once we extended uh, the time horizon, hopefully we'll capture the impact of this, and it's very important. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for those really um, thoughtful questions. I'll answer, I'll try to answer all of them. Um, so I think a couple of the questions were sort of about heterogeneity, like heterogeneous treatment effects by different sort of types of variation. So one, um, heterogeneity by the strength of rebel governance. So we definitely find heterogeneity across these communities in terms of how strong rebel governance was in the past. We don't actually find that the program was more or less effective in those different types of communities. I should say though, we don't have a lot of statistical power to examine that sort of heterogeneity which exists at the, at the community level. So I'm not, I'm hesitant to make too much of those results, but at least based on what we found, there's definitely heterogeneity. So totally in line with Anna's work, um, but it seems like the intervention is equally effective no matter how strong those rebel institutions were uh, in the past, with the caveat that you know we're, we're a little, we don't have a lot of power to really to really pick that up. Um, the question of whether response routes vary by community, so they do. So they're tailor made to each community, um, and this is something we have not explored at all, really. Um, which I mean, you know, we, there's so much data. It actually makes me think Michael and I should probably sit down after this and think about what what we can do, um, because we have. You know, we have like pictures of the response. There's a lot we could do, basically, and we've done none of it. So that's a really great idea um, that we just haven't explored. Um, 
Chris, Christy, your questions. Um, I think there are communities where the juntas are discriminatory. They, they tend to have, you know, in most places, the majority of, of the population of the community is a member uh, of the junta. But you definitely talk to people who, who don't trust the junta, who feel that the junta um, you know, excludes them. And part of the intuition behind the project is you know, maybe by introducing state presence, you create sort of an exit option for those people. And this was actually sort of partly inspired by work that I had done previously in Liberia, where we, where we saw exactly that dynamic, where like cr providing police presence um, w was really helpful to people who felt that they were excluded by communal institutions. Um, as, as to whether they can address illegal activities, that's really tough. Um, I think my, my instinct is to say probably not. I think probably, you know, in places where people are engaged in a lot of activi illegal activities that they're not going to report to anyone. Um, I suspect this intervention is probably not going to do a whole lot of good there. And actually, maybe related to um, the, the question about Northwest Nigeria, so we're working in contexts where there is some level of peace already established. And I think that's, that's a pretty important scope condition for this project. So we intentionally avoided places where there was a lot of violence going on, because we thought, well, for one thing, this just isn't safe for the implementers. We didn't want to send people out to go get hurt you know, in the process of implementing this intervention. But we also thought, you know, these just aren't the types of communities where building these sorts of bridges between state and communal authorities is really going to be all that effective. We need to be working in places where, they're, now, they're not, I wouldn't say they're like all that peaceful. There was still plenty of conflict, right? But they weren't war zones. Um, they weren't places where armed groups were in sort of active um, violent conflict with, with one another. So I, th I think that that's, when we think about sort of where this intervention might travel, you know, where you could implement it, those are the sorts of situations where I think it's less likely to be effective, where there's a lot of violence going on. I, you know, I also think um, we really assume that there are complementarity. So we assume that there's some level of trust in communal authorities, but maybe they struggle to enforce their decision. We assume that probably there isn't a lot of trust in state authorities, but they have some capacity to provide enforcement. There are contexts where those things just aren't true, right? Where, where nobody trusts communal institutions, where the state has no capacity at all. And there, there really aren't any complementarities to exploit, right? So, so an intervention like this, I think, would also be less effective in those sorts of settings. Now, I should say, I think there are lots of places where the state has some capacity and communal institutions have some trust. So there, there is an opportunity to build bridges, but there are also places where that's just not going to be possible. Great. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to this side of the room. Are there any uh, questions for uh, Thomas or Pedro? Perfect. Yourself and then the gentleman behind. Um, questions for Thomas or Pedro? Hi, yes, I have a question for Pedro. Uh, so you seem to describe an interesting trade-off between attitudes for democracy and attitudes for Muslims, if I understand correctly your conclusions. And so I was wondering if you can do anything to disentangle what kind of messages work best to you know, reduce the, the attitudes for, negative attitudes for Muslims while keep increasing the attitudes for democracy. But like, if you can do anything about like, you know, you change the type of message and you see whether there is, like, map out the difference in these kind of trade-offs between these two types of attitudes. And then kind of have like, a, you know, some kind of a policy brief that you can say which is best, basically. Great, and yourself, and yourself. we'll take a couple and then, and then answer. Uh, my name is Samuel Risk. I'm the head of a team uh, working on conflict prevention, peace building, and responsive institutions at UNDP's Crisis Bureau in, in New York. I have about 20 questions, but I'll ask only... <laughs> one, only one very brief I'll, question I'll ask, and, uh, for I'll Thomas I'll or Pedro. I'll ask some quick ones for everyone, and I right. won't say anything okay. again. Um, uh, I didn't see a definition of communal institutions. What are those exactly? Um, are those like CBOs, etc.? Um, organized or not, um, I think it would be helpful to know what, what those are uh, exactly. Um, I don't, one of the things that you just explained now I think answers part of my question, but I think it requires a little bit of digging. The relationship between the central state and local authorities when, especially in the context of violent extremism, when, uh, when you try to get the central state back to, to support local authorities, particularly on security sector, it becomes really problematic because that was part of the problem in the first place. So it seemed to me that you were arguing in a way that might actually reinstate the problem locally by using the, the capacity and the authority of state authority, central authority, 
to recover part of what's happening on the ground. Uh, it would be great to hear about the decentralization discussion because some of these countries actually have decentralized processes, so what are we actually promoting in the end? Um, a question to everyone, uh, you're all dealing with highly vulnerable communities um, as individuals or as communities. Would love to hear about the ethical standards being used in some other spaces. These are, this is called do no harm. In other spaces, it's conflict sensitivity one way or another. May not necessarily be the business of researchers, but in the end, you have an impact one, one way or another. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, I think this is, this is the very last one. Uh, the uh, TRC uh, uh, presentation, uh, very good. I think uh, there, there's, a, there's a recognition in the end that you did actually find that there are changes, um, not necessarily with the black population, but with the white population that is in segregated areas. This might be a, an expected uh, outcome, uh, but I think it would be great to figure out how this in the end promotes reconciliation when already the people that have changed are either part of the choir, those you might assume uh, uh, to do this, but the long-term reconciliation processes would be great to hear. Thanks. Okay, brilliant. So, um, yeah, I've got you. So we don't have much time left, so may I suggest that uh, we've recorded these, uh, these questions. Your last question uh, directed at the TRC. Um, Thomas, if you could respond to the last question of the gentleman from UNDP, and Pedro, respond to the, the question for yourself. We'll take one more after that and wrap up if that's okay, unless there's anything burning. And I would like to say, um, please definitely seek out individually all these amazing people and ask all your questions. Um, it's just in the interest of timing that I'm uh, uh, doing this. So, Pedro, you're up, and then Thomas. Thank you very much for, for the questions, uh, for the comments. So on, on the, the question on, on the messages and, um, and uh, the interaction with the, with the attributes that people um, uh, see uh, on Muslims and non-Muslims. So we, we don't have uh, variation in, in the messages. Um, we have something that I haven't uh, mentioned in the presentation for briefness. Uh, which is uh, we have variation in terms of only Muslim uh, messages and also mus uh, the Christian message. Uh, so, so that that we have, uh, we haven't explored that much uh, yet. This is very preliminary. Um, uh, we we will do that now. In terms of uh, message uh, content, it's not very. There is no no variation there. But it, we we definitely are interested in uh, checking um, the effects on the stereotypes uh, that people attribute to Muslims and non-Muslims. We have the detail of each stereotype and, um, and we will be looking at, uh, at them individually. I've, I've just mentioned uh, something general on positive stereotypes, but we, we have the detail and we'll be able to interact that, what we find there with the effects that I showed on uh, attitudes on democracy and, and, uh, and social, um, so, social issues. <coughs> then there was the, the comment on, on ethics, which uh, of course it's very important. Um, we, uh, we followed the typical procedures for, uh, for ethical, um, uh, for eth ethical verification, namely in terms of consent and the appropriate use of the, uh, of the data. Uh, I, I must say that uh, our data collection was relatively uh, less intrusive than typical because everything is by phone here. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, we 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 are we were less risky. Not not exactly because I mean, of course, all the context on COVID and 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 and, and the fact that of course these locations are uh, some of them um, uh, locations with conflict. Uh, made that made this uh, our option. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Thomas, we're out of time, but please, uh, um, the the last question of the gentleman from UNDP. Okay, yeah, uh, I, I will try to be very quick then, uh, <laughs> so that we can uh, all go for lunch. Um, so yeah, I, I think you are uh, totally right, and that we should uh, explore uh, the the long one. Uh, 
effects on, 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 on peace, and this is actually, so this, uh, what we presented here is uh, really the, the first step of, of the project, uh, just trying to look at uh, whether the TRC has an effect on, on the attitudes of individuals. The next step uh, will obviously be to, to look at whether their uh, behaviors are, are impacted, and that's where we will come to, to this kind of uh, broader uh, picture on, on peace building by looking at uh, data on intermarriage, on crime, uh, and so on. Um, so, so that's definitely something that uh, we do plan to do. Um, and for your other questions about the ethical standards, um, we already knew when we started this project and that and there were studies pointing to uh, adverse effects on psychological uh, um, health and so on. And so for us, it was also quite important to take this into account and to use uh, observational data in order not to take any risks uh, in, uh, in this dimension. So on our side, that's how we try to, to take this into account.